Greetings, everyone, and welcome to Back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. For those of you that are new to the channel, if you begin to love what you are hearing, please consider joining our family by selecting that subscribe button and setting your notification bell to all. That way you'll know every time a video is uploaded. Also, if you'd like to learn how to become a member of Back to Ashes, that information can be found down below in the description box. Without further ado, it is time to go back to ashes, for once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled True Creepy Backwoods Stories. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. Right after the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. Back in 2010, I was driving around looking for a place to bird hunt. I finally stopped at a piece of town-owned property that I had only gone on once before and that was to fish for trout in a brook that crossed about a mile in. After parking, I started down an old tote road that split the property for its entire length. The day was very nice and nothing seemed unusual. I followed the road until I got to the far side of the old wood yard that abutted the stream. That's when it just got quiet. The opening was probably 20 yards across the brook hidden behind some alders on the other side. I sensed it before I heard it. Something told me not to go across the clearing to the stream. I have spent a lifetime in the woods and I have only had that feeling a few times. The first sound that I heard was very heavy footsteps, very deliberate and very slow. I couldn't see what was making that sound for no reason, and I felt fear. I knew that I did not want to see what was approaching me. It stopped at the brook, and I heard it cross and walk to the edge of the alders, then stop. All that I had was a single shot 20 gauge with bird shot. I had a feeling of danger. It moved on the inside of the alders to my left a few yards at a time. The only glimpse that I caught was a dark, narrow figure, very tall, as in at least seven feet. Not knowing what else to do, I pointed my shotgun in the air and touched off a spot. It just stayed where it was. I shouted it did not move. That little voice told me to go. Not run, but go. As I backed up, the alders where I last heard it moved and parted as if it was getting a better look, but whatever it was, stayed right there as if to let me know it saw me, and to go no further. That mile walk back to my truck felt as if I were walking through a cemetery late at night, always turning around looking everywhere. This encounter has played over and over in my mind. I don't know what that was. I have never gone back, only because something inside of me is saying it would not end well. Fourteen years later, and it still scares me. Anyways, that's my encounter, and I've never told anyone up until now. In many rural areas of the American West, cutting firewood in national forests is a necessary chore if you want a warm house through the winter. Our home in mountainous central Idaho was no exception. It was normal for my dad to pick me and my brothers up after school and head into the mountains for an afternoon of firewood gathering. My dad would fell the dead trees then saw them into chunks. My brother and I had the task of rolling the wood to the truck and then loading it. We would continue this assembly line process until we had a truckload of wood. 
usually before nightfall. Hot, sweaty, and exhausted, we would pile into the truck cab and make our way down the mountain. At home, the next day, we would unload and split the wood and stack it into neat little rows. This process was repeated until we had a winter's worth of fuel for our house, our grandma's cabin, and an extra for elderly neighbors. This particular afternoon, we decided to try a different logging road on the other side of the valley. This was well outside our familiar logging area. No real reason for the change, but my dad said he wanted a change of scenery. This logging road hadn't been maintenanced in some time. Large rocks, fallen branches littered the path. My brothers and I had to walk out in front, pushing the rocks and wood out of the way as my dad lurched the truck up the switchbacks. Yard by yard, we slowly made our way up the mountain. That hike was physically brutal. As we ascended the mountain and got further into the trees, the odd feeling started to set in. I wasn't sure if it was the exhaustion from the hike or something more. There was electricity in the air, like the whole mountain was buzzing at a wavelength just below my senses. In some odd way, it felt like the mountain knew we were there and it wasn't welcomed to that fact. I wanted to say something to my brothers, but before I opened my mouth, my younger brother said, Does anyone else feel like we're not welcome here? My older brother and I stopped in our tracks and looked back at him. Both of us nodded in agreement. This moment was broken by my dad honking and motioning us to continue clearing the path. Reluctantly, we pushed forward to a small clearing in the woods where we finally stopped the truck. My dad, oblivious to our apprehension, or simply choosing to ignore it, grabbed his saw and went to work. As the wood was felled and loaded, I couldn't shake this ominous feeling enveloping me like a dark shroud. I noticed my brothers were taking occasional glances over their shoulders as we all worked. Everyone but my dad, it seemed was on edge. The sun nestled down into the trees and twilight began to set in. As the light drained from the sky, my anxiety only intensified. It wasn't until my dad unexpectedly told us to lead up that a wave of relief flooded over me. I could see the tension in my brothers melt away as well. The truck wasn't fully loaded, an oddity. Getting a half load was a waste, according to my dad. We would sometimes work into the dark just to make sure the truck was full, but tonight he seemed eager to head home. With everything loaded, we started down the road. Although dead tired, everyone seemed to be in a much lighter mood. We were chatting and cracking jokes while trying to blow off steam from the afternoon. We were almost out of the tree line and into the valley desert. Going down the switchbacks, you want to be careful, especially with the load. Even if it was half of that, a brown blur jumped up from the downslope side of the switchback. Shit! was the only word that came out of my dad's mouth as he slammed on the brakes, loaded with wood, and traveled downhill. That was no way to avoid smashing into the blur. The truck finally grounded to a standstill. The four of us peered through the windshield, nobody saying a word. Illuminated in the yellow glow of our headlights was a crumpled body of a deer. Grumbling and cursing the deer's existence, my dad exited the truck to investigate. Doing as they were told, my brothers stayed put in the truck. I, however, didn't listen, following close behind my dad. The truck was fine. We hadn't been traveling fast when we smacked into the deer. Just some hair and blood in the grill guard. 
Hitting a deer really wasn't that unusual. The mountains were full of them. What was unusual was that the deer dropped so quickly. At faster speeds, deer could still be upright and sprinting away to die in the woods after a collision. That last burst of an adrenaline dump. This one fell over like a rag doll. Before even approaching the carcass, a deep, foul smell hit us. Deer smell bad when they're alive, but this was on a whole other level. It was the smell of decay and rot. My stomach began to turn as we got closer. My nostrils were burning. Coming up on the deer, it was clearly dead, and I do mean really, really dead. The stench was so overwhelming, my eyes were watering. The body was a true horror scene. The deer's eyes were gone, replaced with sunken hollow holes, as if to overcompensate for their absence. The tongue was swollen and black as coal. It could not be contained and hung out the side of its mouth. The underbelly was split wide open, entrails and offal spilled into the dirt in the dim headlight. It looked as though the deer's fur and viscera were moving, wiggling almost. Holding my breath, I bent down for a closer look and my heart stopped. The deer, inside and out, was covered in maggots. It was dead all right, but our truck didn't kill it. Clearly, it had been dead for days, if not weeks. I backed away, retching. That electric anxiety came screaming back. My dad was always the quiet, stoic type, but... Right now, even in the dim headlights of the truck, I could see the abject horror in his face. His gaze wasn't on the deer, but focused down the mountain. Poorly masking the fear in his voice, he told me firmly to walk back to the truck and get inside. I obeyed without objection. As I grabbed the door handle, a loud shriek came out of the trees. Branches were shattering and breaking. Something was heading up the slope towards us. I slammed my door closed just as my dad reached the truck. Before his door was shut, he pressed on the accelerator. The truck launched forward, sending us over the deer carcass and racing downhill. With mine and my brothers yelling, it was hard to tell if the shrieking was following us. Our truck popped out of the tree line and into the desert sagebrush. Once out of the woods, everything quieted down. We were left with only the rumble of the engine and wind through the half-open windows. Pulling into our property, the truck came to a stop. We sat in silence. No one moved to leave the truck. Everyone started talking all at once. We all had questions. What was the screaming? How does a dead deer just jump up in front of a truck? There was no way the truck killed it. Dad just shook his head and mentioned for us to quieten down. That deer was dead when we hit it. It didn't jump out in front of us. It was thrown at us. We just stared at him. He explained that all day up the mountain he had felt uneasy, not wanting to worry us boys so he kept it to himself. He described it like walking into a stranger's living room while they were asleep upstairs. That feeling never left him, and as twilight came, he happened to catch a shadow in the corner of his eye, not far into the woods, and saw figures moving from tree to tree. He couldn't focus on them long enough for a good look before they dodged between another tree. His stomach dropped, Working hard to keep his composure, he hurried us to the truck to leave. It was after hitting the deer and discovering it was long dead that my dad placed together what was happening. Something threw that deer to get us to stop. Before the shrieking began, he could hear something moving in the darkness beyond the road. It was a trap. 
running back to the truck could have started an ambush or triggered a prey drive. So we walked back to the truck. The second we were inside, he drove the truck downhill with no intention of stopping for anyone or anything. That feeling of electricity didn't disappear until we hit the county highway. My brothers and I never saw anything as we drove away. But those screams from the forest will never leave my mind. We didn't gather firewood the rest of the season. For the first time in his life, my dad just bought what we needed. And although we started to gather wood again the next season, we've never been back up that particular mountain. The Forest Service was permanently closed and reclaimed that road. The only way back up into those woods is a long hike. One I'm not interested in ever taking again. Whatever was on that mountain, whatever through that deer carcass, whatever chased us out of the woods, it did not want us there. It wanted us gone. Or worse, it wanted us dead. I'll start this off by saying I grew up completely 100% adamant that the paranormal isn't real. It can all be rationalized and that people who believe in it haven't thought about it hard enough. I've made other stories about paranormal events that have happened in my life recently that have completely changed my mind. Primarily about my neighbor's house. That's not what I'll be talking about today, though. I live in the Midwest. I live on a small rural lot between a cornfield and a small forest in a camper. I've lived in this county my entire life. I know the entire county like the back of my hand. This being said, I've come to the conclusion that my experiences around the rural and wooded area parts of this county are crawlers. I'm 100% sure of it. I've had many encounters, actually. None back-to-back, -back, but they happen frequently. This is a forest and park in the middle of the town. I always hated at night since I was little. As I got older, my cousin and I thought getting scared was really fun. We'd go there at night on purpose, but never lasted long. I always felt like I was being watched. This, on top of urban legends of people going missing here at night, made me feel really uneasy. Fast forward to a few years ago. I got married and am settling in, you know, to life as a husband. I'd take my large, all-black German shepherd, Fen, on walks with me at night. I always walk towards the park, but I usually don't enter into it. The first time something weird happened was about five years ago. I was walking Fen in the woods to the front and to the right of me. To the left and behind me was a neighborhood, an edge, and a small playground. Went silent. My dog started acting super anxious. He's usually a very stoic and quiet dog. He's 120 pounds and built like a tank. Looks very intimidating, and he knows it. I heard rustling in the woods, following me, and I felt like I was being stalked. I ran home, and that's the end of that first encounter. I had a few more encounters like that, but last year, things really amped up. I was on a walk at around 11.30 p.m. with Finn, my wife, and our little newer dog, Booger. He's a terrier, Chi Mix. We are walking down the same path and about three blocks away from the woods, four or so deer are sprinting out of the trees into the street towards us, and they seem terrified. Then, I hear what I can only describe as what sounded like a human trying to mimic the sound of a monkey. I thought it was silly until recently, when I read that other guy's story who heard the same fucking thing. We laughed it off as some kids playing around. Once we get to the woods and we are walking parallel, we can clearly see two reflective eyes and a silhouette staring us down from the tree line. We also heard a deep growl and then like a hissing sound. But it wasn't super high-pitched or anything. But our dogs acknowledged this as well. 
Finn started and Booger growled at it. I made a Facebook post on the community's Facebook group, and other people told similar stories around town. Around this time, I got a job as a tour guide and maintenance for Rail Explorers. I am working there again this year as well. We start April 1st. Basically, they take unused or tour-specific railroad sections that aren't used frequently, and they have these pedal carts with motor assist on them you can use to explore the tracks. It's super cool and super fun. The one I work at is like five minutes from where I live, and it goes through the woods in an inaccessible part of the county unless you float through the river and hike up steep, loose dirt hills. You go under one old car bridge, and you go over two multi-hundred-foot-length old train bridges. The first one is larger and taller, and it's about 150 feet off the ground above the forest. The second goes over the river. About six months into the job, and it's fall. We work until midnight sometimes, with the last tour leaving at around 9 p.m., that means the last tour for the last two months of the year are in complete darkness. The way that job operates is with six employees. Four get on the lead bike and two get on the rear bike. From the lead bike, we drop off one person at the busy intersection so they can flag traffic. And one person gets dropped off at the large train bridge that goes over the woods. The person at the bridge gives a short safety speech to the customers who stop and go one at a time over the bridge. The employee carts are much faster than the customer ones. We all have walkie-talkies and we usually have these battery-powered floodlights on stands so we can use them to see our customers and they too can see us and light up safety vests. On one particular night, we were behind by 20 or so minutes instead of leaving the depot at sunset. We were leaving at dusk and was stationed at the high bridge. By the time we reached the bridge, it was pitch black outside, from the stars providing a little light. My coworkers dropped me off and waited with me until the first customer arrived. I gave the little speech to that first cart of four. I chatted with them a little bit. I was trying to buy some time and wait for the next customer card so there wasn't a massive gap for my coworkers who have to flip the bikes around. After a few minutes, I let these customers leave, and I was alone. I was alone for about 20 minutes. I used the radio so many times, but it was static for everybody. One of the only times we've ever had an issue like that as well, might I add. I kept seeing movement in the tree line. I kept hearing fast footsteps all around me in every direction. I had the floodlight on above my head, so everyone and everything could see me, but I couldn't see shit. I turned off the floodlight and used my personal flashlight. I kept seeing quick glimpses of pale skin moving quickly, but right when I started seeing stuff, I could hear the next customer card coming close. So I turned the light back on and waited for them to come around the corner. When they pulled up, I noticed that they had a little boy with them, and he's scared of the dark. I'm terrified at this point and have to act appropriate, even more so because of this boy. I do not want to scare him too, any more than what he already is. As I'm finishing my speech, I hear movement right behind me and say, Jesus fucking Christ! and spin around with my flashlight on instinct. That poor kid. I told them it was probably just a deer and they are good to go across the bridge. That same night, the person stationed at the intersection. This isn't like in town intersection. It's very rural. It's right next to a massive cornfield. He's Native American and was very in tune with his culture. He told me privately a few weeks later that he heard rustling in the cornfield, and whatever was out there was whispering his name and trying to get him to come into the field. He was also without communication for those twenty minutes, but he wasn't in the woods and can see a lot better than me. 
Another time, me and that same co-worker were headed back on the front cart. We were away ahead, so we stopped the cart in the middle of the high bridge. It sounds scary, and I am a bit afraid of heights, and this bridge has massive gaps between the planks you could fit through, but after doing it so often, you get used to it. It was a clear night, and we were watching the stars and having small talk. Then, it goes quiet. We are a hundred and so feet in the air, above the woods. We can hear for miles. The dogs barking across the river two miles can be heard without even seeing the houses. We hear the sounds like a human mimicking a monkey noise. And we hear growling. He looks at me completely seriously and tells me in a stern tone that we need to get out of here right now. I drive the fuck out of there, and he moves states to Nevada shortly after this. A few other things happened here and there, and to co-workers as well. Each of my co-workers have at least one story. I'm only sharing mine in this story that I'm telling you. Otherwise, this thing would be too long. A few months go by, and it's late fall, around the middle of November. I drive through that park in town a lot when I just want to go for a drive. I had my dog, Finn, with me, and it's around 2 a.m. I can't sleep, so I'm listening to a Melvin's CD and driving leisurely through the park. As soon as I get past the entrance gates, I feel really uneasy and weird. I'm not easily scared. Going to that park at night makes me feel a primal fear. It's beyond flight or fight. I have never felt that way in my life anywhere else, ever. And I feel it every single time I'm there. I'm driving through the park, and I've rolled the windows up a lot more. Finn can still poke his head out, but can't leap out. As I go deeper into the woods, I feel worse and worse. I decided not to turn around because I'm already past the halfway point. Turning around would make me stay in the woods longer. I started speeding where there weren't turns I couldn't see around. Around the last corner, and what I saw made me have nightmares for months. There was a pale, skinny humanoid. Tall and lanky, not quite human. Fucking crawling on its hands and knees, and it was crawling. Fast as fuck. 20 miles per hour type shit. We don't have bears here. The only animal that size are large humans and deer. That wasn't a deer. It went from my right, crossed the street, and went into the tree line. Finn saw it too. He doesn't bark at animals. Not even other dogs. He went ballistic. He was trying to force himself out of the small gap in the window, nearly foaming at the mouth and snarling. He never, ever acts like that. I'm a certified dog trainer, and I've raised him from birth. Most recently, I've become obsessed with this park. I've walked there at night from my camper to the park with Finn. I'll never be doing that again. I didn't see a figure this time. As I was entering the park, a massive owl flew by my head. So close, I could have smacked it mid-flight. This made me feel weird for some reason. As soon as I get into the park, I feel extremely weird, anxious, and nauseous. I walk a few hundred yards to the only streetlight in the entire park, and I turn around and face the woods. Me and Finn stand there frozen for like ten minutes. The silence was deafening. Any time I heard anything, I would jump. Finn was anxious as hell, too. He kept staring into a certain spot in the woods a ways off. I swear I saw eyes in there, every once in a while. I built up the courage to walk out, and I haven't gone back since. It'll be interesting to see what happens at my job this year. I want to add that the county I live in is packed full of abandoned mines. Hundreds of them.
I was hiking in the Olympic National Forest a few years ago, by myself with my two dogs. We were four days in, around twenty miles at least, as a crow flies from even a known mountain road. I was camping at around seven k feet that night, or right where the tree line started thinning out. So, when we got back to the campsite, a big open meadow on top of a secondary mountain, it was about an hour from sunset. My big dog usually runs around within proximity of the camp, as I put the tent up and make dinner, etc. But, I noticed this time was a little different. He kept staring up this steep tree-filled mountainside, tail straight up and barking. Not the bark when he sees marmots, not the excited, Oh, you mother effers are lucky because I'd rip you all apart if my master wasn't here high-pitched barks, but unsure, concerned barks. Now, the day before, I had found a note left under a rock at the last landmark, saying that there was a problem bear in the area that was harassing a party of campers a few days ago, and I myself had seen big cat tracks the day before, so I was rightfully concerned that this may be more than just ground squirrels. I decided to go climb some of the boulders at the foot of the hill while I took my time looking up the hillside for movement, before I went to go hang my bear bag up there. They were the only trees around to hang the bag. I didn't see or hear anything, but my dog kept quietly whining like there was something up there. So, while still concerned, I start hiking up this steep hill to hang the bag. It was so steep I had to use the trees to balance and lean against so I didn't go tumbling down before making another five to six step push to the next tree I could lean against. Anyway, I'm slowly making it up this hill and ridge, hopping from tree to tree to keep my balance. Then I get about a uh, hundred feet up the hill and I hear a whole lot of big movement, about 50 feet in front of me. My dog immediately goes from a deep low growl to a savage slobber flying everywhere type barking now. My heart starts pounding out of my chest and I start to panic. A million thoughts go racing through my head in a matter of seconds. Because if this is a bear, my dog is going to try and save me, in which he will most likely die, and I'm stuck here. If I have to get off that hillside fast, I almost 100% am going to trip and fall off the 12 to 15 foot cliff onto the boulders below. Like hundreds of 5 to 20 feet boulders, by the way. So I'm feeling pretty screwed right about now. Then, I hear my other little dog start barking and freaking out down at the campsite, which was just out of sight. I had zipped her up in my tent so she didn't wander off while I was away. So yeah, I'm absolutely panicking at this point. A few seconds later, I kind of snap out of it, and I take another few seconds to start to put my survival priorities in order, and call my dog back to me. Loki, by the way. He comes and sits against my feet as my back is against a tree, so I'm kind of pinned and stuck there for a moment. But my dog was seemingly trying to separate me from something up there, so I let him lean against me while I tried to collect myself. This is when I realized I had completely forgot that I had my headlamp on. I reached up so fast to turn that damn lamp on, I basically punched myself in the face. I'm having some serious adrenaline dumps going on right now, so much so that my knees are starting to shake. I get my lamp on and peer up the hillside. I figure I'll at least get a reflection off the eyes of whatever is up there. Peering. Peering. Nothing. But I had just heard something. We both did. And whatever it was... It didn't get away, or sound like it had made it too far. I knew something was there, so I'm kind of just steadfast at this point. 
I need to know what is up there because I have to sleep here tonight. And, you know, I'm out in the middle of nowhere alone. Better to face it than wait like a sitting duck all night is my thought process. So yeah, as I'm looking up this hill, and at one point, my dog lunges forward, unpinning me. He does a fake bluff charge up the hill at about 15 feet, and I mean he's snarling and foaming at the mouth at this point. As he does this, I finally see movement. Something moving up and breaking the line of the horizon and sunset. My dog's bluff made whatever it was blow its cover. So I'm zeroed in. I call my dog back and silently watch. And what I make out made my heart completely drop. There was a man crouched about 75 feet directly in front of me, wearing not camp clothes, but some raggedy shit with a hood that blended into the environment perfectly. Actually, almost like a makeshift ghillie suit, but with his face exposed. I couldn't see his eyes, and his face was covered in dirt or something, but I knew we were staring right at each other at that moment. So I stare for what seems like minutes, no words. I felt like I was trying to subconsciously convey that I was going to stand my ground. I wanted him to know I saw him, but I guess I was just too shaken to speak. As I'm staring, my little dog back at the campsite started to bark her head off again, like she was scared, and I also had to get off that hill before total dark or I could be seriously hurt and risk dying trying to get back down. So carefully, I start heading down the hill with my dog, who doesn't want to leave but listens. Periodically, I would stop with my back against a tree holding me up and look in that direction again, just to make it even more clear that I saw him. And eventually, I make it down the boulders to the bottom. By the time I finally jumped down and hit the boulders, my little dog had stopped barking. I could only see the top of my tent from the bottom of the boulders. I thought she was barking, just to bark. Dash hounds tend to do that. Or just barking back at my dog. But when I get there, my little dog had somehow got out of the tent and was walking around the camp growling with her little tail sticking straight out, still trying to hold it together. I thought, okay, maybe she just got her nose between the zippers and worked her way out. But I was positive I had zipped it so the other zipper, tab, or openings was at the very top of the tent door, out of reach. So, in a mixture of being terrified, pissed off, and the feeling of needing to do something, I reached into my day bag and pulled out my forty. I fire a single shot into the air, and as the sun was setting, climb into my tent without eating and lay with my gun next to me until first light. As soon as the sun came up, I was packing up my shit and leaving, heading back down the mountain. It sucks. It was all downhill back. But I still couldn't cover the ground to get back to my car in one day. It was dark by the time I made it to the last camp about four miles from my vehicle. But, thankfully, there were other people there. We sat around a fire they made, and I felt pretty relieved and safe. They start to tell me they were planning to head that way where I was the night before in the morning. So, I tell them the story in detail. Needless to say, we were both walking back to our cars in the morning. Screw the hell out of that. The thing that still creeps me out to this day, though, is when I got home and started reading reviews of the same hike I was on. Other people have had similar experiences like mine as well. Even a man found dead from a fall around the same boulder range two years ago, and a woman found murdered just last year. I'm sorry, you all. I never make comments about stories or at least try to keep my mouth shut, but that story just scared the shit out of me. I couldn't imagine 
you know, hiking into some woods, finding a good, you know, place to camp and, you know, go climbing or something like that. My dog starts going off only to discover you're being watched by someone dressed in camouflage. What in the actual hell? Yeah, that's some nightmare fuel. Anyway, back to the stories. This just happened about an hour ago, so it's very fresh on my memory. First off, I am living very rural in a small village with maybe 10 to 15 houses, but close to the highway. You can drive there within maybe five minutes, and also about 10 minutes away from town. If you cross the street, it just takes you about a 10 minute walk to reach the forest. First Christmas day, in the afternoon, my partner and I decided to go for a little digestive walk, as we were really stuffed from all the food. It was about 1700 and already dark when we left, and we had a big and bright LED flashlight with us. I also took my camera and my flash, as I love taking pictures of nature at night. We decided to walk on a little country road towards the forest and then turn right, following a small graveled cycle track close to the forest border, which connects our village and the next, maybe 15 to 20 minutes walk between villages. In the middle part of the track, you have to walk through a small bit of forest. It's rather dark and the trees are very high and quite dense. When we entered, I saw our flashlight reflecting on something and recognized a car being parked there on the side of the track, close to the trees. This struck me as odd as cars are not allowed to drive there and the path is very narrow and hidden. So I was quite cautious. My partner pointed the light inside the car and it seemed to be empty. I also noticed the windows were frozen so it must have been parking there for a while. A bit in front of the car I spotted a tree with an intriguing structure and I asked my partner to point the flashlight towards it so I could focus better and photograph it with my flash. After I took a few images, my partner told me, Um, there is someone standing behind us in the middle of the road. He is looking dead at us. Nobody was following us the whole way. I kept looking around and behind us occasionally, because at this time, in the evening and close to the border of the forest, there are boars sometimes, and it's mating season, so they are more aggressive than usual. Indeed, there was a man standing behind us, staying out of the flashlight's reach. He wasn't saying anything, just standing there and facing us. At first, I thought he might be startled, as it may seem a bit weird if someone's just taking photos around your car. It was not even legal to drive on the path with the car in the first place. I decided to get up and confront him from a distance, explaining to him that I was just taking photos of that tree. He didn't react and still just stood there. I then went on to ask him if he needed some light, and he replied that this wasn't necessary. It was odd, but I was still calm sure about there being a normal explanation for his behavior. Nonetheless, my partner and I decided to just get the fuck out and follow the path leading to the next village. It was maybe a five to seven minute walk until we reached it. I remembered the letters on his license plate, not the numbers though unfortunately, and googled it and it turned out that he was from a city about six hours away from our village. Mind you, the country I live in is a very strict lockdown right now, so you are only allowed to travel, even by car, if you have very urgent reasons. After we reached the first lantern of the next village, we looked back and observed the car driving a bit out of the forest, turning around, and going back inside. I was able to see that he parked there again and turned the lights off. He didn't leave the forest. We then went home on a much longer way than initially intended, 
as I didn't want to go back there for obvious reasons. Our flashlight battery died on the way back, and my phone battery was low. So, I didn't want to call the police back then, but I called them as soon as I arrived home and gave them all the details. Big regret that I didn't memorize the whole license plate, but it was just so surprising that I seriously didn't think about it. Also, it only occurred to me as really strange when I thought about the frozen windows and that he could possibly have walked behind us, plus him having no light and not responding. He did seem to be sneaking up on us when I sat down to take the photo. I think I was very lucky to have my partner there with me, the camera and the bright light with me. I don't want to imagine what would have happened if I was alone. So, to the creepy guy sneaking around the forest and up on me, let's not ever meet again. Over the heath, there was an ancient crumbling water house where the entire estate's water system was managed. Believe me, we thought it was a miracle how anything that old and manky could keep and pump out any water. But it did. It was made by bricks with a black slate roof and iron bars. Although at this time of the incident, it was just a shadow of its former self and didn't have any doors. The windows were all smashed in by generations of kids throwing rocks and stones at them. It was there where my mama and her siblings were kids, played over the heat, and they all told us it spooked them and their mates as it did us. It was a really hot day one summer, in the school holidays. The older boys were at home for some reason, and all the younger cousins me included, were being little brats, so the boys said they would take us all blackberry picking to keep us quiet. Mama agreed gratefully, and the boys were really responsible and mature at the 16, 17, and 18 mark. They babysit for us younger kids all the time, so we all knew the rules of staying close to the boys and doing what they told us to do. And so, a half hour later, everyone had their fruit buckets, and we were off. There were five of us younger kids. We were all really excited as blackberry picking was a great family favorite activity and our grand's blackberry pies were the best. Grand's house led directly onto the back of the heath. There was a fence with a gap at the end. One of my older cousins passed me through to the other then lifted my tiny wheelchair over the fence. The other kids were through in seconds and we were away again. On our way to our destination, the elder boys told us spooky stories, as they always did. Half because they liked scaring us, and a half because we all used to beg them to. There was nothing more terrifying than a story for my cousins H or B. They were masters, and so believable. We all loved it. We all stopped talking when we came to the water house. Nobody ever dared to speak around or near the water house, not even the older boys. For something so mundane, it always looked, and still does, so eerie. There was a second fence to get through before we reached our beloved Blackberry field, but this time, as we squeezed through the gap of the fence, we were all more somber as we remembered the old wives tell urban legend that we all know about the water house. The story goes as follows. Once in the early 1960s, there was a gang of bank robbers. They were local to the area and were really nasty pieces of work. Their expertise were terrorizing bank customers and staff alike before grabbing and shooting anything that moved. They did several jobs without ever getting caught, but they really messed up a particular job and a sweet 19-year-old trainee bank clerk was shot dead and five more people were seriously injured. One of the gang was also shot dead, along with the nastiest member of the gang being seriously wounded in a crossfire. 
It is said that the remaining gang members escaped with just a few hundred and made their way over to the heath and hid out in the water house. It was newish at that time and was a perfect hideaway for the murderers. There was a lot of contention and stress between the remaining gang. Months, although it was never ever proven how. The bodies of all three of the remaining gang members were discovered rotting away in the water house six months later. A few years after the weird stuff and creepy noises started occurring near and around the water house, mysterious hairy figures were glimpsed moving stealthily amongst the pipes and wires. A dank, moldy, rotten smell like aging river weeds was almost smelt around the area of the water house, and eerie wells and menacing murmurs would be heard day and night. In the late 70s, there was a spate of mysterious deaths of homeless people who would shelter over the heath not too far from the water house. There was nothing to ever link the deaths to the water house, but the locals soon started giving the water house and surrounding area a wide berth because of the creepy history and dark reputation, and that left the water house abandoned and in disrepair. That's what we knew of the water house's dark history. That is why we were so weary and anxious to get away from it as quickly as possible. When we were all around the gap in the fence further away from the water house, us younger cousins built up enough courage to glance over at the building of ill repute. Before being rounded up by the older boys, A put me in my wheelchair again and we set off to the blackberry field. We soon arrived at the field, where some other local kids we knew were already there and we spent a nice afternoon picking and eating the juicy sweet blackberries and splashing in the river and soon the sun was getting low and it was time for home. Our journey home was more like the one there. We were still bantering, laughing and the other boys were still winding us up, slightly but being as it was getting later, we were feeling wearier and slightly subdued. When we reached the fence, before the water house, the air felt slightly too close, like before a thunderstorm. The youngest of the three older boys got me out of my wheelchair so that B could lift it over the fence. The other kids were already on the other side of the fence with H and B. A suddenly said to his brother in a low, guarded voice, Something moved at the back of there, bruv. B just looked at him sideways. Out of the boys, A was the most likely one to pull a stunt or wind anyone up for a laugh. But A was straight-faced. A said, I'm going to have a look. Passing me through to B and squeezing past us all. Wait up, A. We've got to... Having put me in the wheelchair, B had moved forward towards his brother when we all heard A shriek out in horror and disgust and the two boys move back quickly. H, having already taken me out of my wheelchair again, had told everyone to run. And we did. B picking up my tiny wheelchair, folding it up while running. A grabbing the other two kids' hands and following B and H running with me on his shoulder holding my other cousin's hands. We ran and ran. A kept saying, Don't look back. Don't look back. I did, but saw nothing. We didn't stop until we got to the fence which leads back to the road on the estate, and we could actually see civilization again. We were all completely exhausted, especially the older boys. Before we slipped through the fence to the road, B holding himself up by the railings, asked, What did you see, eh? Y yellow eyes <laughs> on, a, on a hairy face. All of us younger kids began to panic and scream, and H had to calm us all down. He said that we were safe and it would be all right, but we all wanted to get as far away from the water house as possible. When we got home, we all looked bedraggled and slightly nervy. Mama and my auntie noticed this and asked the boys what was wrong. H just said that we just got spooked by an old drunk man in the bushes looking for golf balls to sell. 
and as that was quite commonplace over the heath, Mama and my auntie just gave us kids a pet talk and hugged us. We never did tell Mama or my auntie the entire truth about the yellow eyes and hairy face, or find out what it actually was. But us kids didn't go near the water house for a long time afterwards. My brother is two years older, and we've probably spent 10,000 hours and then some in the woods together. Whether it was building forts or BMX tracks to LARPing and hunting, we've traveled across the U.S. exploring caves, canyons, cliff diving, mountain biking, camping, hunting, whitetail, mule, deer, wild boar, etc. since 2016, when we get the time off. I feel like adding this is important because there's genuinely nothing I wouldn't do or fear when I have him by my side, but this time was way different, and we both felt it. We've had our fair share of adventures and stories to tell of all sorts, but this one has felt like a lingering stain on my memory. We were both mid-20ish, and it was 2019 and this was probably my fifth time hunting the area, and the first I brought my brother along. It's a large forest area of public land that has a few country roads, which are basically two tracks that sketch miles throughout the area. We make the trip up in my truck with our tents, three in total, one for each of us and another to change in and keep our gear in. Without making this long-winded, we set up camp a couple of miles from the truck, which we drove for quite a few miles through the trails. Basically, the middle of nowhere nearest main road is probably 8 to 10 miles away. We arrived late in the night, set up camp, and quickly fell asleep after a long trip. We then spent the next day scouting and tracking, then made back to camp for the night. We cook, then ate, and had some beers and bullshitted. The night was still early, but we had a long day and decided to head off for the night. Everything up until this point was normal. I was suddenly awoke to something smacking my tent and hearing my brother's voice call my name. I knew something was off. I called back to him, and he immediately unzipped my tent and made his way inside. I could tell he was disturbed when I went to ask him what was wrong, and he immediately grabbed my shoulder and told me to shush. The sun wasn't up yet, so I think it was around 4.30, maybe 5-ish a.m. We sat in my tent, and what we heard still confuses me to this day. I can only explain it as well sounds different tones of extremely loud noise that I could feel throughout my body. It would come and go, but there would only be a few seconds of silence in between the sounds. It would vary from high-pitched squeals and everything in between to very low sounds that had literal ground-shaking reverb. I regrettably didn't think to grab my phone or record anything that was going on because... What I was hearing didn't seem real, and in the moment, I was awestruck. The sound went on until daylight started to break. I believe it was about an hour, but I'm not really sure. Neither of us spoke, and at the time, it felt like I could feel the energy around me, almost like my body was covered in white noise, if that makes any sense to you. It wasn't even minutes after the sound stopped, it started to rain, and one of the craziest thunderstorms while I was camping happened. The forest didn't predict or account for any rain the days we were going to be there prior to making the trip. All the stakes for the tent, our gear, wasn't completely ripped out of the ground, and both of our tents had multiple stakes ripped out as well. Those things were drove into the ground with an axe and would take some insane force to unearth even a single one. My brother dismisses it and won't talk about it, saying it was just machinery being dragged. But, 
At the time, we both shared the same feeling of fear and dread. It just seems odd it was still the middle of the night, and we were so far removed from any nearby communities and industry to hear and experience this occurrence. And that, dear listeners, brings an end to these true creepy backwood stories. Before I go any further, I would like to acknowledge the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mead, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Edith Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, Thank you all so much for being the pillars of which Back to Ashes stands upon. My gratitude will forever remain eternal. To the other subscribers or first-timers or anyone that just peeked in to check out the channel, thank you so much for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice and there would not be a Back to Ashes. I cannot appreciate you. Enough. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this selection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves and stay safe out there. I'll be reading to you soon. I hope you have a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good evening. Peace, love, and light to you all.